with this vast piece of public realm in the middle of the city of London, and I mean the, the old city, which is what we're going to explore today. This is called Guildhall Yard. It's hardly a yard in a conventional sense, and it's very much a post-World War II configuration um, of a much older space that's uh, changed over the centuries. I just thought I would point out a few aspects of it architecturally, and just so we get a feeling for it, perhaps if we went back to the start, this was the site they found out of the Roman amphitheatre when uh, London was Londinium, and there is a ellipsoidal circle of grey slate that denotes where the actual Roman amphitheatre was below, about 20 foot below where we're standing. And today you can go in to see the amphitheatre through the, uh, the City Art Gallery that you can see up there, the Guildhall Art Gallery. But before we get to that, I wanted to mention some, what Guildhall is. It's the old governing body of the city. The guilds are met here and this is the ceremonial side of the guild hall. Now all those offices where the city planners work and design our city as we see it today are actually on the back side of this yard, the offices. This is the ceremonial traditional entrances here um, with a lot of traditions still uh, going as they did centuries ago. The guild hall building itself where I'm pointing is with this very steep roof was originally built here in around 14, 1410, 1420 and um, has been much altered and restored. In the 18th century, we can see that there's George Dance, the younger, the architect in London. He built a porch onto the front of the Guildhall to make it more, even more grand and ceremonial. So the traditional entrance of the Guild Hall, where from where London used to be governed, is still there today. Some of the stonework up at the top, near the roof, near the parapets up there, is supposed to be from the original uh, 1400s building, but much altered. And that was partly thanks to the Second World War, which really was the reason for so much London reconstruction. And in the 1960s, just the L-shaped sweep attached to the old hall here, all still part of the ceremonial side of the building, was added by Giles Gilbert Scott. It was sort of finished by around 1960. And it includes this quite unusually shaped um, building that's like an annex with a huge crest of the city on the front. And you can see the city dragons that guard the gates of the city holding the shield of St George and underneath it says Domine Dirige Nos which means Lord be our guide which is the city's motto. The building itself, this little rocket that looks as if it's about to take off, can only be approached from the interior across a bridge. It's the Alderman's Court and the city has aldermen who meet um, at least once a month to help govern the city and the main body, the Court of Common Council, meet in the Guild Hall itself and they are the governing body of, of the council. So it's a sort of mini parliament, if you like. And one thing we forget about the city, because it's so old, it's created a huge art collection that used to be housed in various buildings until the war, the Second World War, when so much of the city was destroyed. So there was always a great need for an art gallery which was built here by Richard Gilbert Scott and finished in the 1990s and it was then that they discovered as they were excavating to build what we see today, the gallery, they, they discovered this amazing uh, entrance to an amphitheatre that we always suspected the Romans had in London but nobody had known where to locate it until the end of the 1980s, beginning of the 1990s. So it's appropriate to start here just as a reminder that the city the city's planning officers, their commissions, uh, offices are in the Guildhall, but not right on Guildhall Yard, as I said earlier, they are behind.
With all the talk of the city, this site here, once upon a time there were about 12 buildings, the largest of which had been a post-war rebuild in the 1950s, Bucklesbury House, all demolished to create a 3.2 acre site here for Bloomberg's new headquarters in Europe and uh, designed by Norman Foster, the Foster and Partners for Michael Bloomberg. This was um, a feat that was all part of Bloomberg's aim to become much more user-friendly and known by the general public as media par excellence and not a specialist um, business media. The Bloomberg site um, was not a simple site once it was cleared. Again, we had Roman stuff to contend with, which I'll mention later. But the building is created in two pavilions that are linked across the street. And the street that you might be able to see now, while people moving up and down, is an extension of a street on the other side of the main road called Watling Street that had been closed off for generations. So with a, a big new double pavilion home for Bloomberg, we've actually got a lot of uh, improvement to the city's public realm, a generous offer. In front we have some sculptures, but these, the things that everybody notices about this building is this um, sandstone as opposed to the Portland grey Portland stone that we're so used to in buildings this size, or massive glass. The glass here is, is darker and the sandstone frame of the building is punctuated with bays containing these gills, as Norman Foster liked to call them. They make the building breathe. There's parts that open and uh, filter fresh air into the building. So they're part of the um, eco-friendly credentials of the building, as well as being um, its rather unique um, appearance in the middle of the city today. So a ground scraper, not allowed to be any higher than the 10 storeys where the tops are recessed. And the two pavilions are linked, as you can probably see, by the bridges between the floors above ground. And um, below ground, <coughs> they are also linked um, and on ground level with the extension of Watling Street. We've got the restaurants where the public uh, are welcomed to, to uh, join uh, the creation of a new building here. Now, I wanted to walk into the side of the building so we can just have a look at some of the internal credentials of, of the building. One of the reasons this won the Sterling Prize in 2018 when it was completed was because the building really shouts its, um, its eco-friendly credentials here. Sustainability was the key. And uh, measurements of um, using 40% less water or 40% less this and that are known to the people inside. But from the outside, we can just glimpse one of the big um, uh, improvements for office environments from the outside here to a building that is very much closed off to the public. So if you'd like to follow me down into this area, for all its uh, external user friendliness we feel when we're outside around the perimeter of this building it is actually a very much closed off to the public but Michael Bloomberg who owns it says he really wanted London to accept him as a good neighbour which is one of the reasons why he restored the medieval grid pattern with this extension of Watling Street that had been closed for so many years but he also um, wanted the public to know a little bit about the internal workings of the building and was very happy with the publicity um, for the, um, the system inside the building that you and I may not be able to go and see but we can see from the windows there's actually in the ceilings um, around most of the floors in this building a total of 2.5 million petals, aluminium petals that um, conceal behind them uh, the lighting and the cooling and the air filtering um, for each floor. 
Each floor does have its cooling system, of course, but this is one of the reasons why it's using so much less energy and came to the attention and probably tipped the balance in favor of the Sterling Prize. But a lot of people have pointed to the fact that the embedded energy of the building should really have included uh, how many thousand tons of granite that came over from India, quarry full of granite, as they said, or even a um, uh, should take account of these bronze fins that we were mentioning earlier, where all the bronze came uh, all the way from Japan. Japan supplied the bronze fins. So uh, it has its detractors, but overall, um, nobody could argue with the fact that by opening a brand new uh, exit and entrance to Bank Tube Station, much needed on this side, just uh, um, to the north of where we're standing now, was one of the good neighborly policies that worked very well for the public. And the other was to transform the old Mithraeum that had been discovered when Bucklesbury House was built here in the 1950s. The old Roman remains of a, a temple to Mithras um, was actually uprooted and planted elsewhere. And um, what Bloomberg has insisted is that it was restored. They spent the money to restore it back again about 20 feet below where we're standing now in a Mithraeum museum um, which is absolutely free to the public to enter but at the moment I'm not sure that there is any uh, entrance to to the Mithraeum but that was another addition uh, giving back to the public plus of course this huge expanse of public realm. The building behind me Cannon Place above Cannon Street Station was finished in 2010 um, by uh, English architect Foggo Associates and the, one of the reasons to point this building out is it's a remarkable piece of um, engineering for the modern city uh, and concealing a huge history and giving a, an idea of what today um, planners, developers, the clients, the architects, everybody has to consider when they're looking at um, remodeling and replanning the city um, in, in, in large projects. Cannon Street Station needed rebuilding, um, but um, what we can see with the mainline station on one level is one uh, issue, but below it, of course, is Cannon Street Tube Station. So there are two levels. There's Transport for London and Network Rail, and the idea was to um, reconfigure a much larger um, more economically viable building over the top um, without damaging in any way the two layers of transport below without interfering with transport during the building. To see the secret of how they managed to do this is we have to once again go below. We're talking now medieval London, the steel yard, or which was built on Roman ruins, but it's right on the banks of the Thames. Um, the steel yard ruins were made it a scheduled monument beneath the street level that not many people could see or knew about, but it was certainly a huge issue for the developers. They got round a very difficult problem, a very sort of tense uh, uh, problem which about 10 different people were giving their version of how this building should be made. They've ended up with basically four pile, four table leg piles on the four corners of the, of the building, as you can see here, going down towards the Thames. But it's only the central one that is actually attached to the four table legs on either side of the building. The nearest, the nearest and the more distant supports of the building are cantilevered so you needed engineering by excellence here to carry the weight and if you look carefully the side of the building is divided into three slabs with this huge gigantic cross bracing supporting the whole building and the cantilever in the front facing us is very clearly uh, marked and you see how the weight of that is taken into these two huge trusses in a V-shape down into the ground. And as I said, this all had to go over um, 
the railway and the underground beneath. And with the foundations being very limited to those four table legs to support the whole building, it didn't interfere with the steel yard, the old trading post from medieval times that still sits below. The offices are not tall. Every single space had to be used. And from this angle, it's not possible to see, but the plant of the building was actually an adjunct, an annex building that is attached to this building, but on the other side, on its uh, eastern side, not on the side here that we can see. When during the building, they never once stopped the railway, they never once stopped the underground either. And one of the great offers of Fogo's design, even though he was told he had to be at least five meters above the station shed on the ground level, he couldn't build, start building the offices above, he still managed to uh, make um, a economically viable, if you like, economically viable set of offices that have never really been empty since the building was finished. How many people know this is here? St. Swithin's Church Garden still a, a relic from the old St. Swithin's Church that was uh, destroyed here, oh, in the uh, Victorian period, 19th century. But the one of the really nice things about the city is we are paying far more attention these days to preserving a lot of the alleys. But this is one of those that is still a dead end, which is not the ideal. And a lot of the um, resurrection of the old <coughs> city's medieval grid pattern entails opening both ends of alleys so they're no longer um, shut off or dark and un unsociable as we'll see later in the walk. But uh, here at Oxford Court, the back of where St. Swithin's Church is, beyond me is the backside, which very rarely is seen, of the Walbrook, which was completed in 2010 um, by Norman Foster Partners and the the history behind that building was it just took a lot of time to get off the ground and it finished actually just one year after the worst of the credit crunch of uh, 2009 that really affected a lot of city development plans, put things on hold and destroyed plans altogether. But this small garden has been maintained and behind it you can see the louvres that look like they're either steel or aluminium, but this is a fibre reinforced polymer that has been used and developed specifically for aircraft uh, in the aerospace industry and it's been uh, tested, if you like, for the first time in the city to act as louvers in front of dark glass of the Walbrook building, the other side of which you've already seen. Now, um, the building, unbeknownst if you stand at the other side, is an L shape, which you can see clearly here. And uh, 10 stories high, it starts to lean uh, in a bit and become slightly domed and that is so it doesn't interfere with the dome of St. Um, Stephen's Church on the other side and uh, sticks to the, um, the guidelines of um, height in this particular part of the city's area. Um, other than that we can see that Oxford Court as it's called would have, would have been a very important court, a busy court, a court meaning like a courtyard or a, um, a place where buildings surround a, a, a carriageway. But here it's been blocked off on the other side um, by the back of a, a new hotel in St. Swithin's Lane that we'll be walking past in a moment. The character of what was once a rather dark alley here has completely changed with the development of Angel Court, which is the tower that you can see with this lovely pearly, pearlized glass, and the lower garden pavilions, as they're called, down the side, which were all part of one structure uh, called Angel Court, um, in a really dark maroon, black-flecked granite kind of lent heavily into the 
alley here and made it actually one of the least pleasant areas to have to walk through. But it's such a convenient cut through here, Angel Court, between Throgmorton and Cocktall, that uh, people just used it and rushed through. So it was a sort of heads down and rush through. And you certainly didn't want to be walking through here at night. Whereas now with this um, retrofit, actually, it's uh, the original octagon structure that was uh, clad in granite has been completely stripped out down to its core and rebuilt uh, with the same eight-sided effect although the smooth curves take away from the fact that it is still an octagon if viewed from above it's clearer the building itself is uh, all offices in the tower and then the garden pavilion down the side with this incredibly uh, new for the city, it sort of looks like some kind of volcanic grey stone with very, very deep window reveals, um, um, all in white, contrasting, uh, lending itself again for more outside space, which was never here before. Makes this place still quite a, a, a lovely place to come at any time of the day and at night the glass of that building is quite strange, it changes its texture, it's actually a double fritted white fritted glass and come evening the lights inside can be visible you can't actually see inside but the building is all illuminated but if you work inside that building you can see outside uh, clearly but it gives a sort of um, a volume a tall volume curved volume of of light uh, in in one sense like a great pillar so Angel Court, a place which used to be just um, a, a run through, has got a new character of its own. This is, do, this is really Fletcher Priest who have got a thing, uh, Keith Priest recently talked in an interview to Peter Murray how he wanted to see all the dead end alleys of the city turned into uh, through ways which we'll see more of later um, and this is one of the the ideal situations that he was in, that the that uh, Fletcher priests were able to adapt and make it once more um, a public realm here, generously giving back not only where you can just sit here if you go to either of these restaurants, but going through, or standing outside the restaurant on the other side to have a cigarette or something. It's not an unpleasant area at all. The entrance was interesting because they borrowed um, from the building. Um, the, the breadth of the building. They took um, quite a chunk, as you could see from the breadth of the entrance to the engine, uh, Angel Court. The breadth of it has been more than doubled to give, um, and from this angle, um, inside the court, you can see quite clearly the intention here to make this once more a, a livable, breathable space for the overpopulated city. Building behind in the, the very tall building was the first building by the architect Raphael Vignoli in London and it pretty soon got the nickname the walkie-talkie because of its extraordinary shape. Around 37 stories high it's topped by what is called the Sky Garden and three levels. This is open to the public and it affords incredible views of course across to South London at the best time of day. And if you wanted to go, you really have to book online ahead of time because security is still quite tight to go in the building. The building was built on a very limited footprint and the, the construction itself was quite extraordinary. The city had never seen it before. The core, the central core of the building was built and about four huge cranes were winched up there and all the construction happened from the top. So the building was um, put together and clad from winching up um, ready-made um, curtain walling that was delivered at the uh, non-peak hours of the city working. It was one of those 24-7 buildings that went up quite fast. It opened in 2011, but its opening was preceded by a very hot summer and um, glass of the building 
managed to uh, make the building, uh, make the pavement around the surrounding building, surrounding the building, get extremely hot, and bikes were melting, and dashboards of cars were melting. So, the reputation of the building was uh, really preceded its uh, finish. It was 30% lead when they were starting to build, and by the time it was finished, it was all totally lead. In London, everybody wants nice views these days. So if you have got a tall building, people will pay a premium to be at the top. Well, on the seventh floor of this building, the floor plate is less than half of the 33rd floor as the building bows out on all sides at the top. So they got their, uh, they got their sums right on this one to make the most money out of people prepared to pay for a, a view. The top, the top floors were definitely the premium floors. The wind around the building has also given it some problems, but it's still there and it's been sold a couple of years ago. Um, the original owners are uh, Land Securities and um, the Songbird, the Canary Wharf people. They sold it to Chinese food industry actually in, uh, I think, two, two summers ago. Buildings like Fountain House behind me are becoming somewhat of a rarity. In the post-war city of London, the urge to get building and get offices back to working and get the economy back on its feet again was so strong that a lot of buildings were not given um, maybe that much attention but had to be built fast and well enough for offices to refunction. Fountain House was by William Rogers who was heavily influenced by the American uh, the New York buildings that were going out in particular in the 1950s, the Lever House. The Lever House with its large podium and slab top was a paradigm for many city buildings that you won't see today and this is what makes this one so special. The average age of a city building um, was, is probably now something like 25 years. These buildings, in particular Fountain House built in 1958, is a, they're few and far between and you can imagine with its huge footprint, it uh, has several developers after it, um, salivating at the thought of redevelopment here, I'm sure. Fountain House is actually owned by one of the old livery companies, the Guilds of London, called the Cloth Workers. And on this side of the road of Fenchurch Street at Dunstan Court is the old Cloth Workers Hall which is uh, due for demolition soon and maybe to be redeveloped by Eric Parry as the tallest green building that's going to happen in the city. Um, but Fountain House fate is still not yet sealed. Fen Court on Fenchurch Street is a brand new expression of how best some of our latest architects in the city like Eric Parry have come to terms with the huge restrictions and still managed to create something that is a delight to walk in, around, through and on top of. Feng Court is approached through one of those city alleys that has always been wanted uh, to restore in the city. Hogarth Court as it's called. It's a sort of, uh, a, it's a run through that's on an incline and in the shape of sort of two fish tails, it's a really welcoming entrance into a court. And at the center of it, you might be able to see a huge um, LED screen reflecting chosen patterns of the day. Originally, it was to reflect the garden that is on top of the building and it's open to the public, but it's not open right at the moment, but do keep an eye out for coming here when times have returned to somewhat more normal times again. Fen Court is an office building and originally um, funded, uh, the client was Generali, which is Italy's top uh, insurance company, but the ownership changed during the building. 
and for the first 10 stories you can see the sort of terracotta and stone work with glass and glazing of Eric Parry and on top like another building altogether it has a coronet it's crowned in what we call dichroic glass glass that reflects more than one color a range of colors is reflected here the first time the city has ever seen such a color storm on top of one building with this glass surrounding the top five floors dichroic glass it's only the second time that we've seen the buildings in the city lit up at any time of the day or night. The first being, of course, Lloyd's of London, the Richard Rogers building that really was the watershed and changed the way we looked at the city from an architectural standpoint. To be lit up in one colour blue was phenomenal. It was one of the most exciting points mentioned um, by all the architectural critics of the day in the 1980s. And here we are into the second, well into the sec the end of the second decade of the millennium and we have a whole coronet of colour. We'll see it from another angle later. If you want to walk through Hogarth Court here into the centre atrium of the building, there you'll find the lifts that can take you up to this amazing garden that's on the top with its own little rill stream running through and views because it's not such a phenomenal height you find the views are far more appealing from a slightly lower height in some of London's gardens. In front of the Allgate Gyratory landmark, as it was 10 years ago when it was finished, the Nicholas Grimshaw St Botolph's building, banded in a very strong blue, is now a totally new layout of a gyratory, which was all the state of the art and all the fashion in the city and elsewhere um, in the 1960s when road traffic was thought needed severe radical reorganizing. Several gyratories appeared and the Aldgate gyratory was probably one of the least successful and longest lasting. It took nearly seven years to redesign this gyratory and build what we now have, which is a lovely open space, Allgate Square, within the background of St. Botolph's Without, the church that you see, St. Botolph, the patron saint of wayfarers. Um, St. Botolph's churchyard it rightfully attracted a lot of wayfarers or if you'd like to call them homeless a lot of people using the church garden made this area not so happy apart from the massive traffic gyratory the pedestrians were forced to go underground through a huge series of very unwelcoming tunnels which certainly by night were not uh, advisory, advisory to use so Allgate took seven years to rebuild into the square we see now with a paved area, lots of seats, a grassy area by Gillespie's, all designed by Gillespie's and a sort of landmark point in the middle of the square is this lovely pavilion now called the Port Socum Pavilion designed by Sarah Shuttleworth from Make um, to be a sort of hub, a community hub and to link to link the church with behind the John Cass, Sir John Cass Primary School, the last primary school for children in the city. The, the pavilion itself has got uh, secured on three points and like its sister pavilion, which is the information office next to St Paul's Cathedral, also decide, designed by Make some 10 years ago, has a, a roof that will um, give um, a cover and an accent to the building in a cotton steel brown to link the brick of, the, of Sir John Cass School and St Botolph's Without. And the layers of cotton steel are such that they will collect the rainwater down to the ground where those roof lines hit the paving. So a 
a cafe without a back to it. It doesn't need a back. It's surrounded by glass on all sides. And if you go in, you will feel um, the airiness and the repeat in the soffits of the restaurant of this caught and steel layered roof. The design is very bright, airy, it's all lightness. And if you go downstairs, they've taken over, a small part of the disused subway has been taken over to provide the kitchens and the plant and the loos for the cafe. So everything on the ground is open and approachable from every angle. This ends our walk today a Covid walk if you like, a walk to see the city in a very different light when it's uh, busy but nothing like as busy as it normally is. But we can still examine how, how well the city works and functions. So regardless of the conditions of lockdown that have obviously kept a lot of people at home working rather than in the city, we can see how the city's resilience uh, from good planning uh, good architecture, interesting ideas, focusing on all the constraints that the city's always had, its density, on how to marry a public realm with a very busy office and uh, which underpins the whole economy of this country. Um, we've now been able to take a look at it in a slightly different light and maybe with a, a thought towards the future in our post-COVID days. I hope that it's given you maybe some food for thought how we're going to come out of this with the city still intact and the centre of our vibrant economy.